e to the ax out, because we see that in both places. So what we're going to do now, it'd be really nice if we can combine these together, but what's preventing us? It's the stupid constants outside. So what we're going to do is we're going to rename some constants. So I'm going to use uh, C1 prime and C2 prime. <coughs> and let's see. I have a lot of dot, dot, dots in my notes. So we need to fill all these guys in. <laughs> oh, let's write down some identities we did back, uh, I think, a section ago when we were doing that. It felt like we were doing random complex uh, stuff. We were preparing for this moment right here. So let's go back to chapter 18, which was complex stuff. Cosi, here we go. Ah, those look really familiar. That's not coincidence. So we're going to use those two right there. So that's why we did this way back when. So try to remember those. I'm going to go to the next page where we stopped. Cosi plus. Actually, I had them written down in my other notes. I'll just. Pull this page open. So we had e to the i z equals cos z plus i sine z and e to the minus i z cos z minus i sine z. So this may seem strange of why we're doing all this work. And eventually, we will get to a form that will look a lot nicer. We're just going to have to walk through the woods for a little while the fire swamp, if you will. So we need to do some more work. So let's rename our constants. Let's call them C1 prime and C2 prime. And that'll let me call their new constants just regular C1 and regular C2. So we'll give these some primes. I think that's the only place we used them. Yeah, right there. So we have I. B or BIX or IBX. <clears throat> so if we change these around over here, E to the IBX. So this will be cos BX plus I sine BX and E to the minus IBX. It is the second one, cos bx minus i sine bx. And now we're going to make these substitutions in here, and hopefully we'll get to where we need to go.
So we can combine the cos bx's and the, carefully we'll combine the i sine bx's. <coughs> Did I do some questionable math here? No, I was curious where the primes came from. Oh, I just renamed my constants. Like we just chose C1 and C2. There's no reason that we use C1 and C2 other than we do it because we we do it. Like there's no reason I use C instead of some other letter in the alphabet. I just wasn't sure if we were doing derivatives on it or something. No, no. So those primes are just other C's. Um, and sometimes people will use a bar instead. The problem with both of those notations is they both have a separate meaning. So, n well, bar has lots of meanings. It, for us at the moment it means conjugate. It also means average. It also could mean I just want a different letter and I can't think of another one so I'll just put a bar over top. So unfortunately these primes don't have anything to do with derivatives. Okay, that's good. Alright, so I'm combining these two and then we're going to combine the other two together and we got to do this carefully with our constants. So we have C1 prime plus C2 prime. So it looks like this. So we got our C1 plus C2 and our other one plus, uh oh, no, no, we have our C1 prime. So there's going to be an I factoring out. And then we have C1 prime minus C2 prime. So we have the sum of two constants and the difference of two, const difference of two constants. So both of those individually are some other constant. So we got some new constant here and some other new constant. So here's where we're going to use C1 and C2. So what I underlined, the first one will be C1, the second one will be C2. So we got new constant. level okay for viewing purposes. I can't zoom in much more because our algebra takes up so much space. So we'll just go C1 cos bx plus, let's do something weird, C2 sine bx. So C1 will equal C1 prime minus C2 prime. So it looks like I made a mistake, but I didn't. What does C2 equal? Well, hopefully I didn't. What did I replace when I put in C2? I actually replaced a little more than I underlined. Is I going to change? Better not change. So I is constant. So C2 is I times C1 prime minus C2 prime, which may seem a little strange, but C1 is a real number, and this means C2 is going to be a complex number. So it's a constant, but a complex constant. Does the plus or minus matter on C1? Not, you add two constants, subtract, you just get another constant. So it's not, it would have gotten the same result if it was a plus there. It would just be a, well, in that particular case, they would actually be the same number. Like both those would be the same actual number. So I could just go C1, C1. Right, C1 at the bottom. Right. Where C1 equals C1 Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. That, that one, yeah. Oh, that's probably the mistake you were thinking of when I asked what mistake did it, did it look like I made. I did make that mistake. I wasn't sure if that one mattered. So that final form right there is a lot better than what we went through before. 
So what we're going to do is use this form right here when there is uh, complex roots. So it took a while to get there. Oh, we can do some fun trig now. Okay, let's do that. So this will give us a bunch of alternative versions that you could write yours somewhere up here. So this is one version you could use for YC right here. That's one version. We turned YC into a second version down here. Here's a second version you can use. And we're going to uh, figure out two more versions that you can also use if uh, these two don't work. So we'll do some more trig here. So we basically have C1 cos Bx plus C2 sine Bx. So we're going to do something that will look very strange. So I'm going to factor out that number. So how do I factor it out? Well, you basically force it. You just divide by that number. And these squareds are actually squaring the variables here. So this is not, it's not like some other constant. We're actually squaring C1 and we're squaring C2. So remember, C2 is complex, so it's a reasonable chance that that value is co a complex square root. And in which case, well, we won't have to simplify them down, but you did that before in pre-calculus class, where we did like square roots of complex numbers, cube roots of complex numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So these are still complex values, and you can take roots of complex values carefully. So we can rewrite it like this. So let's build a triangle that has these sides. So I drew this triangle like it was a right triangle. Why is this a right triangle? It's not because I drew it like a right triangle. So we're sort of using the Pythagorean theorem in reverse. If I have these three sides of my triangle and they satisfy the Pythagorean identity, my triangle is a right triangle. We have always used it, at least I've always used it the other way around. Oh, I start with the right triangle and I can figure out my third side. But if I start with three sides that have this relationship, I am looking at a right triangle. So we're kind of we're going using it in the inverse way that we normally do it, use it. And I can look at either angle. The angle we'll look at is the one that's in this standard position right here. Actually, let me switch C2 and C1. Good news is it's still a right triangle, even if you swap those two sides. And we'll use delta for the angle. <coughs> All right, what is sine of delta? C1 over square root. That's C1 over hypotenuse. So C1 
over square root. Yes. And of course, cosine is adjacent C2 over that hypotenuse. So we're going to make some substitutions now. We're going to take out these, uh, con these strange constants, and we're going to put sine uh, delta and cosine delta in there instead. There's something we can do with the right side here. What trig identity can I use on the right side? Is it side two theta? Almost. I think this will be the one that goes sine cos cos sine is the so cos cos cos. So this would be sine of the sum uh, the yeah. sum formula for sine yeah. is what we're looking at. Actually, there's a I hope it's a sum formula for sine. I think that it is sine delta plus bx. Let's see what the notes say. Uh oh, the notes say cosine. Uh oh. Uh oh. Did I mess up where I put these? I probably did. No. Oh, there's two choices, that's why. So we're going we're doing one of the two choices now. So this is sine delta plus bx. So let's rename some of this stuff here. So we got a constant in the front. So we'll just call that new constant. C3, sounds good. C3 sine. Oh, we got three constants. We're supposed to have two. So B is not an arbitrary constant. B is supposed to be, ah, somewhere up here. What do we assume? <coughs> so B came from our solution. So B is not arbitrary constant. So B was fixed when we figured out our complex root. So A and B are not actually arbitrary constants. They came from when you found your root, A and B were fixed right there. So whatever your root was, so if your root, for example, if you got a m equals 1 minus i, b would be negative 1. So when you get your complex roots, that's a and b are fixed right there. Does that make sense? They're not arbitrary constants. And I'll write that down here. Uh, 
um, they are the, well, that's a good way to say it. They are the solution to the characteristic, is that what we call it? I think it's called a characteristic equation. All right, so when you see a B appear, it's not some arbitrary constant. It is whatever uh, it took to solve that um, original equation. All right, so here's, an, here's another form we could use. Now I did make a choice on our triangle up here. I could have made a different choice. Let's call the other angle, oh, well, they call the other angle delta in the book also. What's a Greek letter near delta? Epsilon? Might as well go epsilon. So we'll go we'll call the other one epsilon. So we're going to do a similar game, except now we're going to use epsilon instead of delta. So what is sine of epsilon? So opposite C2 over that square root. And cosine is C1 over the hypotenuse. OK. So let's do the same thing, except we'll use this other angle. So same triangle, but we're looking at it at the other angle. And we're going to change. Let's do some copy paste. Maybe it'll work. All right. Oh, where's the copy button? <laughs> Control C. There it is. Control C. Scroll down. Paste where I want to. <coughs> Not what I want. I don't even know what in the world that is. Probably somebody's grades. <laughs> All right. All right, we'll just rewrite it. That's fine. There it is. C1, oh. C1 cos Bx plus C2 Bx equals square root. So that first one is cos epsilon. That C1 over the hypotenuse is cos epsilon, and the second one is going to be sine epsilon. And might as well sub in our constant right here. So we'll call this square root, that other constant. Let's go with C4. Oh yeah, it would be C3, so we don't need to just reuse that C3 up there. All right, this trig identity goes cos cos sine sine, so that's a cosine sum. Well, it's cosine difference, because the sine goes from positive to negative. So this is C3 cos epsilon minus Bx. And cosine is an even function. I don't really need that extra parentheses. So I could write it as cos negative epsilon minus bx, which is cos bx minus epsilon. And actually, I want to write the other order for the sine as well. Although the sine is trivial to change the order because it's addition, addition is commutative. So this is C3 sine 
bx plus delta. Okay. Now in either of these, delta or epsilon, whichever form you use, that is an arbitrary constant right there. Based on, you could compute it if you knew C1 and C2, but it's based on whatever C1 and C2 would have been, would have changed what epsilon or delta would be. All right, let's write all these together. So four versions of the solution. Hey, look at that. We tied together pre-calculus 2, infinite sequences and in series, imaginary numbers. Yeah, it's like the greatest hits. All right, we'll write the chronological order. So C1, E, A, plus I, B, X, plus C2, E, A, minus I, B, X, that was the original. And the second one, C1 cos BX plus C2 sine BX. Third one, C E to the AX times sine bx plus delta and last c e to the ax as cos bx minus epsilon and i have an extra parentheses i don't need and we'll write, so these are the four versions you can use. Web work might prefer one over the other. They might tell you, <coughs> I'm not sure what web work will prefer, but there's four ways you can write the solution down. So depending on which form you use, two of these will be your constants. So whichever of the four forms you're using, just remember A and B are not the arbitrary constants. It's the other letters that are there. Okay, so that was a lot of theory. Let's solve y double prime minus 2y prime plus 2y equals 0. So because you know this is going to have complex solutions, at least it better have it, because we just went through all that complex stuff, this will have exactly two solutions. So they should be, the complex numbers should be conjugates when you figure out what the roots are. So keep that in mind. It's degree two, so you're going to get two solutions. They have to be conjugates. Hopefully they'll be complex. So go ahead and solve this. You can use any of the four forms. It doesn't matter which of the four forms you go for.
I cheated a little bit on my Y prime and Y double prime, which you can totally do if you know what you're doing. So remember, Y is e to the AX, so this is written out exactly the way that they were before, I just left in Y. And of course, we know Y will never be zero because of the way we defined it. You may not have gone complete the square. Quadratic formula works just as well, whatever you're into. So any questions on the 1 plus i, 1 minus i? All right. How did you get your minus parenthesis 1 squared? That is the complete the square. So complete square. Okay. So I use this. This is the one that I find to be the most useful to use. Right here. Uh, it's usually taught like this. And that's kind of the other side. And then for some reason, people are afraid of fractions, so they let c equal b over 2. So they'll write it like 2cx plus c squared. So I think that's normally how it's taught, something like that. Uh, but the reason I don't do either of the second two is because you have to mess around on both sides of the equation. And we're working with an expression. We don't want to do something like add a number to it. We can change the form. And so what we do is turn that. In our case, I think it was x squared plus, plus 2x. We want to change that into x plus or minus something squared. And the price we pay to do that is that extra minus 1 squared, like that. So this first form that I wrote down lets us complete the square in an expression instead of needing an equation, basically, where you would mess around on both sides. You can do that if you really wanted to. But if, for example, if I wanted to add 5 to both sides, the problem is there's not both sides. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 sides here. I'd have to add the same number to all 8 expressions on the board, mm -hmm. or else I wouldn't be doing algebra. Because I needed to you know, change the form of the original. OK, so we'll just go with the first form. Actually, the last one is less writing. Let's go with that last one. So I'll just rewrite it exactly the way we wrote it up there. So we have to be very careful. A and B are not whatever you want. What is A and what is B? So A is definitely 1. What about B? Oh, man. I'm going to make a choice. I don't think anywhere we assumed B was positive or negative. We did make one assumption somewhere when I divided by this thing that that was not 0 right there. So we did assume that was not 0. Uh, but I don't think we made any assumptions that B had to be positive or had to be negative anywhere. So you get to choose. Do you want to go with the positive or the negative? That's a good question. 
So I think the way we treated it, it would be the positive value. So let's go back and look at the way we actually treated B, complex roots. So if we look at where B originally came from, it was the solution here. I didn't ever assume that this was the positive one and that this was the negative one. Like I didn't ever use the fact that, uh, I never needed to use the fact that B was greater than zero, for example. So let's look at what happened to the Bs and see where they went. So we had, so here's our original one that we wrote out. And so you see the B in both places. And in this case, it doesn't matter which of these two was the positive and the negative, as long as one of them is, um, let's just say I picked the positive B. So one of them is, like this is one solution and that's another solution to the characteristic equation. There's no reason why you couldn't trade places right here with your two solutions. And so, uh, because of that, it doesn't matter if you go with B as the positive number, the positive coefficient, or the negative coefficient. So this was just a choice. I didn't say that this was the one where it was, had a positive complex term, and this was the one where it had a negative complex term. We never used that anywhere in any of the work that we did. So it doesn't matter which of those two is the plus or the minus. Um, and because of that, you can choose B to be the positive one or the negative one. So I say to have one less negative sign, let's let B equal positive one. So you can choose which of the two you want to go with. So I'm going to go with the positive. Now, just a word of warning, if B equals zero, you don't have a complex solution. If B equals zero, you have a real solution. So we didn't really assume B was not zero, but when we said this is a complex solution, uh, if you had a real solution, you, you should look to the other ones, uh, not to this complex solution. So we have C, E, now A is one, so it's E to the X. Cos, we're gonna use one, x minus delta. Now what would have happened if I chose the other b? And I'll make that choice in blue. Now this is our final answer right here. There's no more constants that have to be thrown in. We got two constants on a degree two ODE. So that's what we expect. One constant for each degree. So this is our final answer right here. Now, let's say I went A equals one, B equals negative one, plug all this stuff in, Y C of X equals, so with cosine, cosine is an even function, so I could make the input negative or multiply it by negative one. So because cosine's even, I can just change the input to be negative of the original. So that what ends up happening is your delta becomes negative of what it would have been if you made your other choice. So that's the effect of choosing negative. So it doesn't matter which of the two you choose, I just recommend go positive. There's no reason to put an extra negative sign when you don't need it. So that's, that's Carlson's advice for complex be positive. Complex roots. Be positive, yes. When things are complex, be positive. <laughs>